Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, we are here tonight to talk about the SARE Farmer Rancher Grants. And um, my name is Liz Brownlee. I'm gonna show you all some slides so that we can learn together about how this grant works. Um, I'm really grateful you took the time to be here. And let me just go into presenter view. All right, there we go. Um, I'm really grateful you took the time to be here because like you, I'm a farmer and I know how busy it is right now. Um, I was just carrying feed to turkeys. Um, so I um, appreciate your time and um, we're going to have plenty of time for you to ask questions also. So first, let's start with, are you in the right place? Uh, so for starters, what is this grant about? Um, the grant helps farmers explore innovative ideas and share what they're learning with their peers. That could be through research, you know, maybe trials or experiments. It could be through demonstration or it could be through um, education. And we're going to talk about all that in detail. Um, big picture, the funding can be up to 15000 if you're a single farmer applying or up to 30000 if you're multiple separate farms applying together. The deadline is December 5th of this year at 4 p.m. Central. And who's eligible? Anybody who self-IDs as a farmer or rancher in our north central region. I'll show you a map later of the 12 states, essentially the Midwest and the Plains. Um, and so it doesn't matter what scale you're at. Um, these grants, um, you can be eligible whether you're a super small scale uh, urban farm, whether you're a very large row crop operation, a livestock farm, a winery, anywhere in between, um, you count. And um, we're excited to, to share about these grants that you could apply for. So to that end, our plan for today is I'm going to tell you just a little bit about who we are um, so that you know, you know, kind of who you're applying with. Um, go over the basics of this grant. Talk through what you need to include in your proposal, where you can find help, and then we'll pause for Q&A. And then a bonus round if you want to stick around for the second chunk of this hour. Um, we'll go through step-by-step -step directions on how to use our online grant system so that you feel equipped to start working up your proposal. All right, so who or what is SARE? Uh, it stands for Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. Um, and our program is a national program, but we, the staff here, we just cover the 12 states in gold there. Um, I'm in Indiana. Marie's in Minnesota. We have staff kind of scattered around our 12 states um, and what is it that we do? Our mission is to advance sustainable innovations to the whole of American agriculture. Um, and I think that, um, you know, we've been at it since 1988 and, um, we've done a lot of good work and there's way more to do as we all know. So that's why these grants are so important. First though, before we go to the grants, a word about the fact that Sarah does have kind of two arms. So in case you don't know this, um, we have all these books and bulletins, that basically summarize and, and compile the things we've learned over the last 30 some odd years from on-farm trials. Um, so they're about the best practices on with sustainable ag of all different sorts, from pastured poultry to um, cover crops on large scale to working with um, youth. It's all over the place. Um, and those are all available online as digital copies for free, or you can buy them as print copies. Um, so I'll stop about outreach, I could go on. Um, but peek at some of our resources if you haven't ever. And then there's the big part um, focused on grants, and that's what I get to do all day. Um, so I think it's important to point out that we really uh, try to embody um, being a different kind of grant program than a lot of the other ones that are out there. Um, we were started in 1988 to be um, all of the following decentralized, science-based, grassroots, practical, problem-solving, and inclusive. And we've been working really hard at all of those for a very long time. Um, it is a competitive grant making program. And so we're going to talk about how you can make your application stand out. Um, but I think that you're going to find that we're a really friendly grant program. We're here to help if you need help thinking about your application um, or managing your grant if you receive one. So all of our work centers around this, this basic overlap zone that you see on the screen here. You know, sustainable ag, you've probably seen this as a three-legged stool or some other metaphor before, um, but we think about agriculture that is ecologically sound, socially responsible, and economically viable. That sweet spot in the middle is where SARE works, and so if you're thinking about some sort of project on your farm or ranch um, that's maybe overlapping two of those, maybe it just focused most on one, 
or maybe it's all three, um, we'd love to hear about it. I think that I'd like to show you this list. I mean, this is just a big picture overview of the types of projects um, that Sarah has funded in the past. And the types of projects we fund change over time as new innovations are made. Um, but uh, I think that probably whatever you're thinking about would be in our wheelhouse. Okay, so the other thing I want to emphasize is that our grants are very much about problem solving. So SARE grants explore problems identified by farmers and ranchers, and farmers and ranchers are involved in the project from start to finish. And, and so that's especially important for like researchers to know if they're applying for grants, but this grant is specifically only for farmers and ranchers to apply for. Um, so you're the stakeholders and the leaders. Um, okay, so let's dive into this grant. Um, if you haven't already, I want to start by saying there's this really great document. I might be biased, but I think it's great, uh, called the Call for Proposals. And you can get this from the website. I've got the link there and the QR code. Um, it goes through all the details of the grant. Um, if you haven't read it already, download it later tonight and take a peek at it. Um, but I'll be, I'll be walking you through many of the highlights from it today and referencing it too. So, okay, so what does Sarah Farmer Rancher Grants fund? Um, like I said at the start, on-farm research, demonstration, or education mm -hmm. projects that explore innovative solutions. And I highlight the word innovative um, because we are not here to fund implementing best practices. You know, if you want to start doing rotational grazing on your farm, um, we cannot fund that probably because that's already a pretty well-established best practices in most communities. Now, if there is no one doing it in your community and it is still innovative where you are in your setting, then maybe, or maybe you wanna refine a piece. So there was a, a piece of that puzzle. There was a farmer rancher grant last year looking at what would it look like to have um, automated feeders in a rotational grazing setting for poultry, right? So are you still pushing the ball forward? Um, because innovative could mean a completely new idea it could mean building on a best practice, or it could just mean an idea that's proven in other places or settings, but it's innovative in your community. Um, and in your application, in your proposal, you'll have to lay out why your idea is innovative and why it will contribute to sustainable ag writ large. Um, so I think this would, I didn't come up with these very wise words, but one of our um, colleagues did. He said, okay, so SARE grants help farmers and ranchers gain the knowledge they need to fundamentally improve their farm's economic, ecologic, and social viability, and then share that knowledge. Um, so the, the difference between, say, funding just uh, implementing a best practice, and instead, since that's not what we do, instead we fund testing out or demonstrating innovative ideas, um, it's about gaining knowledge, not just about implementing an idea, uh, a practice. Let's look at some examples. That's going to help. So I'm going to give you an example of each of the three types. So let's start with research. Um, this is a project in Kansas in 2021. They did a hemp variety trial. Um, and their goal was to compare yields and processing compatibility for three different seed varieties. Um, and I highlight this project in part because it was done on a, a large scale, which I think is really important that folks know that we have projects of all different scales, but also because it didn't work. Uh, this project did not go as planned, but that's part of what science is all about. On-farm research, negative results are still important results. Um, so, for instance, they didn't learn what they thought they would because they had a lot of crop failure, but they learned that planting dates were more important than genetics. They learned that manual weed control was critical at that stage um, as they think about um, hemp being still somewhat restricted in Kansas. Um, and they also did a ton of outreach. Um, you can see just some of what they did to share out what they learned. Um, and they actually said that one of the best outcomes of their project was just the, the farmers learning together, getting together at these events um, to, to trade knowledge and share. So that was a research, a trial project. How about an education one? This is a project from Ohio. Um, uh, this is um, Pastor Aaron, and he um, just did a beautiful job of engaging high school age youth um, with sustainable agriculture practices by looking at black farmer heritage. Um, and so it was a paid internship program that focused on historically black farming practices as a motivational and inspirational tool. Um, and if you, you're saying like, hmm, I'm interested to learn more about that, 
you can do so. Um, so Sarah, uh, we have a, a, what do we call it, Marie? Is it a podcast? Is it a video cast? Is it a series? It's a video podcast series. <laughs> it's all of the above. Okay, so we highlight um, past grantees sharing out about what they learned. And I'm I'm highlighting it here in part because if you're wondering like, gosh, I don't know if my idea is a fit, it can be really helpful to watch some of these. Um, I watched one today while I was washing eggs um, to see like what's the breadth of projects that are being funded by SARE. Okay, one more um, example here for you. Here's the demonstration project. So this farm is in Michigan and their goal was to demonstrate that it's possible to plant some of these longer term, quote unquote, riskier pro um, crops like walnuts when they're interplanted with shorter low risk crops like peaches and sheep with um, pasture for sheep and, and hay. And so they just did this on 1.5 acres of existing pasture, um, but they did it to really trial some of the design, some of the layout, and to show how much hay and forage could be coming off these places while the trees grow um, and demonstrate it in their community in the, the northern part of not the UP, but the main part of Michigan there. And they got some really neat data. I encourage you, if you're thinking about intercropping or silvopasture, to check out this project. Um, I could talk for hours about it, but I won't. I'll just show some of their outcomes. And maybe more importantly, show the amount of outreach they did. This was a demonstration project, so they really built in a lot of outreach. Um, they, re they reached over 600 people and counting, and, and that included a field day on their farm, a presentation at a conference, an interview on a podcast. Um, they were also featured on Farming Matters. So just to say that that outreach can look like whatever you include in your proposal, but especially if you're thinking about a demonstration project, including a lot of that outreach is important. Okay, now that we have a couple of examples under our belt, let's go uh, into some of the details here. So again, the amounts that you can ask for are up to 15,000, or if it's a team or two of more farms, individual operations working together, up to 30,000. Um, we definitely encourage you to work with university or nonprofit partners. So for instance, if you say like, hey, I'm excited for this work, but I've never hosted a field day before. See if your local extension or soil and water or food council or someone else might be game to collaborate on that part of the project and talk with them about, you know, would they need any money set aside in the budget for that event, for instance. Um, we don't want you to feel like you're alone in this. Um, and just thinking about the numbers, we can fund about 40 projects each year, and we usually receive around 150 proposals. So a little better than one in four are selected. And you're probably thinking through, well, what can these grants pay for? Like what costs are eligible and what are not? So I want to emphasize that the expenses have to be directly related to testing or demonstrating innovative ideas and sharing what you learn with your peers. So um, some examples of what that could look like could be labor, like your time or other farmers who are involved, their time could be um, supplies for a trial. It could be travel to present at a conference, maybe soil sampling. Um, field days, anything you need to directly carry out the project, except the following. We cannot fund day-to-day -day farming expenses or most farm startup costs. We can't purchase land. We can't pay for major infrastructure, permanent things like buildings, um, wells, buried irrigation lines, certainly vehicles. Um, can't pay for insurance, licenses, warranties, etc. And so there's a full list in the call for proposals. But as you're thinking through your project, if you've got something where you say like, oh, I'm not sure if that's eligible or not, give us a call, shoot us an email, bounce it off of us. Um, we can just chat it through. Okay, let's talk a little more about the outreach piece. Um, I really uh, believe deeply in farmer to farmer learning. I think it's what works best. I think it's what we all enjoy so much. And so we've, um, we don't just include that because we like it. We include it because this is federal funding. The goal isn't just to invest in your farm. The goal is for that knowledge that you've gained to ripple out. And so what you learn or develop during your project is not proprietary. So we need you to share that out. It might mean sharing the designs for a solar powered tractor. We just got to visit with a farmer in um, Wisconsin who is doing that. Um, and he's putting together all these great video tutorials about how he built this thing, how he converted a uh, 1980s tractor to solar power. Um, 
It could be through field days or farm tours, um, social media updates regularly, maybe conference presentations. You don't have to do all of the above. We want you to pick a few that you're gonna feel excited to do and um, tell us about those. So who gets to decide what proposals are funded? Um, we, I'm really proud of the fact that we have a peer review process. So we have a group of 30 farmers and ranchers from across our 12 states, from a variety of backgrounds and expertise, um, and gender and age and race and geography. Um, and these folks read all the proposals, they score them, and then they get together in person to debate which ones to fund. The criteria they use to score the projects are all in the call for proposals. So my pro tip here is try scoring your own application. Draft up your proposal and then you or maybe someone else um, who could be objective about it, try to score it and then see how you can improve. The review committee puts together a slate of who they think should be funded and then that's passed to our administrative council and they make the final decision about who is funded. Um, so speaking of decisions and such, let's look at the timeline here. So December 5th is when these proposals are due. By mid-February, the review will be done and the decisions will be made and we'll notify you one way or the other. If you're funded, by mid-April or May, you'd get the first 50% of your funds. In about a year, January of the following year, you have a progress report due. And after you turn that in and it's all approved, you get another 35% of the funds and then another year later, or whenever your end date is, up to a year after that, um, is your final report. So you can have up to 23 months. You're allowed to propose a shorter project. If you have something that's only going to take a year or 18 months, you can do that. Um, once that final report is in and accepted, you get the last 15% as a reimbursement. So I want to emphasize that the whole idea here is that SARE grants are a financial cushion for testing out an innovative idea or demonstrating it to your community, but it's not free money, right? It's it's sort of like a fee for service because you're providing the service of doing this work and sharing it out. Um, and so I think it's worth pausing to look at like, how does this compare to say a loan or a cost share? So on a grant, do you pay it back? No, this is money that you get no obligation to pay it back. Um, but it's generally a reimbursement. So you got to have some upfront capital. You're going to get 50% upfront, but not all of it. Um, and so in our example, you know, we know what the goal is here, innovative and, um, innovate and share knowledge out different grants have different goals. So if you're thinking about applying for others, um, look closely at what those goals are. I will say Sarah grants, farmer rancher grants are really great first ever grant. If you've never applied for one, or if you're still building those grant writing skills, um, the nice thing here is not only will you um, have to articulate what it is you have in mind, you'll get feedback from the reviewers, written feedback. Um, how does a grant compare to a loan or cost share? With a loan, obviously you pay it back and that can be more for like purchasing land or expanding your farm. A cost share, a good example of that is the EQIP program with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So they can pay for things like high tunnels, um, water lines, wells, pasture plantings, etc. So they're helping to fund um, in implementing best practices around sustainable ag. And so I always want to make sure that people know that that is a, a resource. If you need any connections on that front, follow up with me. Okay, let's say you apply, you put in your proposal, your project is selected. Um, I encourage you to, to think ahead now about what your cash flow should look like. When are you spending money? You can design your project, your grant activities with this cash flow in mind. Um, so I'll just let you look at that for a second. One more thing on the money. Um, income from this grant is considered taxable income. So talk with your tax professional about how this income will affect your tax reality. Um, you know, thinking about when's it going to come in relative to your other expenses and, and farm business. Okay, we're going to dive in now to how to actually write the proposal. So I think of it in four steps. And we're going to talk through each one of these today. You can also find a really detailed step-by-step -step plan for writing a proposal um, on our website. So step number one, decide if your idea is a good fit. Read the call for proposals. 
um, look at what's been funded recently and um, look for SARE projects that relate to your idea to see if your work is going to build off of things other farmers have figured out. I'm going to show you where to find all these things. Um, on the SARE website, northcentral.sare.org, if you click on the Farmer Rancher Grant page, which you might have already done to register for this webinar, on the right you're going to see these buttons and you can click um, for a read the call as a Word or PDF document. Um, that's going to get you the call for proposals. Also on that Farmer Rancher page, if you scroll down a little bit, there's a list of the 2023 projects. I think it's really helpful to see what's been funded recently so you can get a sense of like, oh, am I thinking about the right like scope or scale of project? Um, or like, gosh, I don't know what I want to put in for outreach. You can see some of the examples. Um, you can also look via a map. Really fun to do. Peek around that map and see what's been funded in your area um, or maybe where you grew up or whatnot. Um, the other way to search is through our grant management system. So there are two separate websites for the SARE, for SARE. One is where we were just at, um, but this is actually the website that you use for applying, projects.sare.org. It's also, and we'll go through all that, but it's also where you can search um, in detail about past projects. Um, and so if you want to look up um, past projects to see if your work is actually, um, uh, if it definitely is innovative or if it's building on existing work or it's trying something that's already happened but in your setting. Um, you can look and use this just like a Google search, um, but you can use lots of different options to narrow your results back. Okay, step two, ask for help. Um, we want this to be um, farmer friendly and rancher friendly. So um, there's my number. You can text me or call me, my email. Um, also, every state has a state SARE coordinator, and so um, on the website you can click on state programs and find your person. That person has part of their job allotted to helping folks with SARE grants, um, and um, they may be able to do something like review your draft if you get it to them in time. Um, or the Michael Fields Institute, they're a nonprofit that actually provides free one-on-one -on -one grant writing and grant management support. Um, so reach out to them via the email there, and um, they can help you think through maybe narrowing your idea or um, focusing, thinking about how to focus your interests in a way that will make a really strong application. And then obviously you have people in your own community, extension educators, maybe staff with soil and water or natural resources conservation service or otherwise. All right, step three of four, um, develop your proposal. So... Your proposal basically has three parts. The narrative part, where you describe your who, what, where, when, how, why, how, the budget, and some attachments. So we're going to talk through all three of these sections. Um, let's start by looking at this narrative. I will say from the start, when you're drafting this, definitely encourage you to draft it in like a Word doc or a Google doc. It makes easy, editing a lot easier and, of course, collaboration. And then once you have a document you feel really good about, copy and paste those answers into the SARE system. Um, the full questions and the details about how to answer all of them are in the call for proposals. Um, so there are eight questions that you have to answer. Some of them are short, some are long. I'll give you a second to look at these. Here are the last four. And I'll just point out that on number seven, the contribution to sustainable agriculture, that's where you're going to say you're actually supposed to articulate. Have other people tried anything on this front before? Especially, are there any SARE grants funded that have looked at this kind of a this topic? Um, so... That's where that SARE database comes in handy. Um, okay, so let's say you've knocked it out of the park. You've done a great job on your narrative. Next step, you need a budget. Um, and it's really just listing out one line item, line item at a time what you need. So here's an example. Um, somebody's doing a, a trial that involves wine cap mushrooms. They need spawn. They probably should have listed the word spawn there, wine cap mushroom spawn. 
um, the amount, the total cost is $60. And then the justification, that's not a uh, uh, prompt for you to say why that item is needed. Um, instead, it's just, how did you get to that amount? Um, so in this case, the packages of Spawn cost $30 each. You need two packages, they're 60 bucks. Let's look at a couple more examples. Let's say you need some tomato starts. They're $4 each, you need 20 plants, that's 80 bucks. Maybe you need some personnel. We strongly encourage you to compensate yourself or any other farmers that are included. Um, the USDA rate for a farmer is $25 an hour. Um, you can decide what that hourly rate should be. In this case, it's an intern. The description says what they're going to do. And the justification lays out the math that got to that full amount. So number of hours and rate per hour. Um, travel, that's you know miles um, for the round trip, and then the IRS rate per mile. Um, there are a bunch more examples in the call for proposal. There's um, there's also a video about how to make a budget. We'll get to that. Okay, the last of the three main things are attachments. Um, so, letter of support. This is simply a one-page letter, um, including some or all of the following. Um, maybe, uh, uh, I should say, who writes a letter of support? Someone who can speak to something like this. The why your experience um, is going to help this project and your ability to carry it out, um, an explanation of why the project is needed or how it will benefit the farming community, or um, if that person's going to maybe help support your project by teaming up on a field day, uh, or the outreach, or soil sampling, or interpreting data, etc. Uh, so people who might write a letter of support could be an extension agent, um, some sort of other ag professional who works for maybe soil and water or for the um, State Department of Agriculture or your county. Um, it could be a staff person at a nonprofit that serves farmers uh, or a ranching organization. Um, there's uh, not a wrong answer for who writes a letter of support. It's just someone who can speak to your uh, skills and or the importance of the project. Please ask these folks early. Um, give them a heads up sooner rather than later that you're submitting this proposal and you'd love a letter from them. You have to attach it in your proposal, so you need it well before the deadline. Um, the next uh, attachment is only if you're a team of two or more individual farms applying. But if you're looking at that $30,000 maximum amount, um, when you press submit on your proposal, um, you will have included your team member's email uh, and contact information. Those folks are going to get an email where they have to affirm their participation, and there's a one-week deadline on that. So make sure that they are checking their email. <laughs> um, if you're an individual project, that one doesn't apply to you. And then last but not least, everybody has to answer at least the first question of the livestock care plan. If your project does not involve vertebrate livestock, you'll just answer the first question, no, and then you can move on with the application. But if you have livestock, um, you need to, um, in, in as part of the project, you need to answer the questions. And we don't want this to be a barrier. If you have questions about it, reach out. It's asking for basic things like, um, you know, what's the shelter for the animals? What are you going to feed them? Do you have a vet you can call? Um, the goal being that um, any animals involved in a, a study of any kind are treated humanely. Okay, step four. This is the last one use the online system to apply. Um, I will say we have some brand new video tutorials on the SARE YouTube channel about how to use the online system. So if you say like, hey, I got to get out and do evening chores. I'm ducking out right now. That's fine. We will send a video recording of this webinar. But you can also look at the, the short like two to three minute videos that walks you through how to make a budget how to do your outreach section. And it's got not just me talking, we've also got past grantees sharing about their thoughts on these topics. Um, right now, I think we should pause for questions. Um, Marie, could you help me out with those? Yes, I can. Um, the first question is, I know that permanent structures are not allowed, but what about a portable building? Great question. Um, yes. So if the structure is 
permanent, meaning it has concrete footers, it's got electric wired into it, uh, etc. That's how we sort of draw the line around permanent. If it is something you could drag, for instance, um, or even like a hoop house that is really just rebar in the ground that you could deconstruct and move to a different part of your farm, then that can count as um, just supplies um, or equipment. Um, let me know if that answers your question or not. And if you're not sure, by all means, shoot me an email. I'll run it by Jean, our grants and contracts person, and she can give you a firm answer before you go building an entire proposal around it. The next question is, can I pay myself for my labor? Yes, absolutely. Um, I had a SARE grant about a decade ago and I did not include enough money for myself. And I put so much work into that project and I, you know, I'm really proud of it and glad I did it. Um, but I strongly encourage you to learn from my mistake and <laughs> include a reasonable hourly rate. Pay yourself for your expertise um, and for your time. Sarah states that farmers get paid $25 an hour. Is that a required standard or an accepted suggestion? It's a USDA suggestion. So um, if you feel like that is not the right number, you can use whatever number you propose. Um, you can put $10 an hour, you could put $50 an hour, but if it's gonna be more than 25, I would explain why. Um, and um, the, just remember that the folks reviewing these grants are your peers and they know how valuable your time is. And so they want you to be compensated appropriately. If I'm buying seeds for a project, do I need to list each and every type of seed? Great question. Um, if they are seeds for annuals, I don't think you do. I think you just say seed and maybe in parentheses, give some examples and make sure to list whatever the unit cost is, if it's per ounce or per pound and how many you're getting total. If it's perennial seed, um, we can only pay up to 50% of the cost. And that's true of if it's rootstock, bare rootstock for tree plantings, for instance, or whether it's pollinator plantings um, or pasture seed, any of that, because the, the expected lifespan is more than a year. Um, then we can only pay up to 50% of the total cost. Um, so I should probably have a slide on that, the 50% rule. <laughs> so if something co counts as um, uh, equipment or is, has, so it either has a lifespan of more than a year or it costs more than $5,000, we can only fund up to 50% of the cost. I'm gonna note that for next year. We need a 50% slide. Fire away. How would someone go up go about setting up a grant that is focusing on the youth educator grant, but then rolls into the farmer rancher grant? Mm, the old one two punch. I like it. Um, hmm. I might have to think about that a little bit. Um, definitely follow up with me. I think that that I could see that happening though, where you say like, "Hey, we're going to start by engaging youth in developing, let's say, a community garden space." and then, or a productive, you know, urban farm. And they're gonna help plan it, and that's part of what our youth project is. And then we're gonna later apply for a farmer rancher grant to get some of the funds for some aspect of that operation um, that we wanna demonstrate to our community. I'm just spitballing, but I'd love to talk more in detail about it. Um, we can set up a time to talk, or there will, there will be office hours where we could talk in more detail um, starting next week. Liz, can someone have both a youth educator grant and a farmer rancher grant simultaneously? Oh, um, yes. I think technically you could. Um, you can only put in one application per grant type per year. We have six different types of grants. Some are really aimed for um, educators. Some are aimed for researchers, some for farmers. But if you wear multiple hats, like pretty much all of us do, um, you could put in uh, in theory, one per grant program per year. And they could all be funded. Um, the next question is, what if your project costs more than the max? Don't they all? Um, <laughs> that is okay. Um, but in kind of a funny little quirk, like we really only need to know about the part that you are doing with SARE funds. 
So I think it's great in the proposal to lay out that context, like, hey, this is part of a larger project, we're going to be funding the rest of it out of pocket or with this other pot of money. Um, but in terms of what you actually include in the budget that's in your proposal, you really only list out the line items for what you're going to use SARE funds for. And when you report, let's say you get funded, when you report in, you're only going to tell us about the SARE funds that you spent. Um, you can mention in the narrative, like, actually, this whole thing costs $40,000 um, so that others who might be interested in that sort of project can learn from you uh, and your experience. But we only need to know about how the SARE funds are going to be used. If you're doing um, a project with more than one, does it have to be a farmer? Oh, um, yes. The other entity has to be farming or ranching. So it's possible the other entity could be like a nonprofit or a city or a school. Um, if they are um, producing crops that could be sold um, or products, I shouldn't say crops, it could be meat chickens, or it could be eggs, or it could be, you know, leaves made out of willow. I don't know. Some sort of product, agricultural product that could be sold, and they count themselves as farming or ranching, then they could be the other partner. Um, does that answer that question? Let us know. Um, how does this farmer rancher grant work with regards to beekeeping? Hmm. Uh, bees are fair game. We have a lot of bee projects. Um, they, you do not need a livestock animal plan, I think, right? Because they're not vertebrate livestock. Um, and uh, yeah, look at the SARE database. There have been some really neat bee projects over the years. Um, and we always end up having some beekeepers on our review committee for that reason, because we want to have that expertise. Can an old high tunnel be converted or used for livestock? I don't see why I couldn't. Yeah, I use a, a caterpillar tunnel for my laying hens in the winter for shelter. There are lots of creative uses. Um, it'd be neat to document some of the benefits of that or test out different different ways some of that infrastructure could be reimagined. The next question has a couple parts. So Okay, I'm ready. Is, how do I account for estimated costs? For example, if something costs 15 cents a pound now, but when I need it, it might cost 25 cents a pound, but the cost is still unknown. Yeah. So how do I account for all that in my proposal? I would say personally, I am fiscally conservative uh, in like my farming ventures. So I always assume things are gonna cost more than I think they will. And if I save some money, great. So that's the way I would approach this as well. I would say, if you think there's a good chance it's gonna go up to 25 cents a pound, budget for 25 cents a pound and if you get into the project you know it's funded and you're part way in and you got a good deal and it's only 18 cents a pound um, you can use that difference the money you saved on a different line item we're totally happy to see those funds switched over to personnel because you spent more time or i don't know um providing better lunch at your field day um the the way the reallocation of money works just big picture is if it's under um, I think if it's under 10% of your total project cost as long as it's still helping you reach your objectives and an allowable cost great and if it's over 10% of the cost you just have to write us a note and say why you want to do this and we have to get it approved um, but there there's not like endless wiggle but there's uh, I think a pretty realistic approach that prices change um, especially in a two year long project in today's world. Um, let's see, and I think this is follow up to a previous question about who can be, if you're doing more than one farmer on the project. Mm -hmm. What if they're doing something like videography? Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, so they would just be a contractor or a, a vendor that you could use SARE funds to pay for their work, but they wouldn't be a, a partner who would count as a secondary applicant for you. So that secondary applicant then has to be a farmer doing farm related work as part of the grant. Yes. Thanks, or Marie. Rancher. Or rancher. Absolutely. Yeah. The next question is also a longer one. What if you pay less than what was in the budget? 
say you budget for a small slab of concrete and it's three thousand dollars but when you get it done it's twenty five hundred so you end up paying five hundred less than you got approved in your grant do you have to do you still have to spend that do you have to give it back how what happens so if you have something else within your budget that you want to spend that money on you know say you want to um increase the number of uh, maybe undo one extra round of your trial, let's say, or one extra field day. You could shift that money over. Um, if you just said like, no, I just didn't have, I don't have to spend that money and I don't need, I don't need that money. Um, if it was like the very last thing you did on the grant, you would have to, um, you would just get less, let's see. I think in general, you would just receive less money from us because the last 15% of the grant funds come as a reimbursement. So at that time, you would just, in your final report, say, yeah, I didn't need those $500. And we'd say, great, we're going to write you your check for your last 15% minus $500. That is the last question in both the chat and the Q&A section right now. Great. Um, by my clock, we've got 19 minutes, which should be plenty of time to run through the rest of this. So keep thinking of questions. If you don't uh, think of them today, think of them tomorrow. Shoot me a message. Um, we've got time before December. Okay, so let's just go through. Um, I'm going to buzz through this slide. There we go. Some details about using our online grant management system. Um, Projects.sayer.org. You're going to either log in uh, if you've been here before. Maybe you've had a SARE grant before. Uh, or served as a reviewer in the past, or you're going to create an account. When you create an account, I want to point out that it's going to ask for demographic data. Um, this is not tied in any way to your application. We're asking you to fill this out so that we can improve, so that we have a better sense of, are we reaching farmers and ranchers from across the whole of agriculture in the North Central region? Um, once you've filled that out, you're going to see a screen that includes this, um, this set of links. And so to get started, you're going to choose start a new grant proposal. You choose our region, the North Central region. And then which program you want to apply for. We have four different uh, grants that are open right now. You're going to choose the Farmer Rancher Grant and you're going to begin a new proposal. And it's going to start with some things that you have to fill out to keep going. So a title, a project description. If you're not sure what your title is just yet, just put in some sort of placeholder. Um, you can come back and edit it later. But once you press um, edit title, it'll let you fill something in. And you'll press save. Always press save after every single answer. Um, let me show you an example of that. So it's going to ask, well, what state are you in? You're going to choose from a drop down menu. You're going to press save. And then instead of there being a red X by that question, you're going to get a nice happy green check. Um, and you're going to know that you can move on. And pretty much at any time, you can return to the proposal overview, which is kind of your main page. Um, or if you're rocking and rolling, you can just press next section and keep on answering questions. When you're on that main overview page, you're going to have you're going to see this um, area with the main sections of the proposal. Um, and so there's just the basic information. There's the proposal itself, just answering those eight questions, the budget and then the letters of support and an animal livestock care plan. Um, if you want to hop around, you know, you want to start by working on the budget, you can just click right through to that. Um, this lets you choose where you're going. Um, once you have completed one of those sections, though, you're going to see that the red asterisk is gone. Um, you can still go in and change your answers, but that's, that section is fully complete once the asterisk is gone. Um, a few details about the budget, so you can see how this is going to look. Um, for every single line item, you're going to um, click Add a Budget Item. And when you do that, you're going to get a box that looks like this. And you're just going to fill out these different sections. So first, you choose what type of expense it is. And there's a drop down menu with four or five options. If you're not sure, shoot me a message and ask. Uh, or ask your state coordinator. Um, don't, don't wonder. And if you get it wrong and your project gets selected, we'll fix it on the back end um, if you're just not sure.
you're going to type in a basic description. Um, you know, is it wine cap mushroom spawn? Is it, uh, you know, seed for a trial? What kind of seed generally, maybe? Um, is it labor uh, for uh, doing the field work involved in the project? And then you're going to include how you calculate the cost. So that means the cost per item, how many you need, and the total cost. Um, if you're not sure about how to do this part, let me know. We'll walk through it. And then last but not least, you just put in that total amount. There are a few details here. Um, we ask people to round to a whole dollar. So in this particular example, they rounded up. Um, there is a full-on uh, example budget in the call for proposals. Peek at it. It might walk you through questions you have. And if not, I'm here. You're going to click save after every single individual line item. Um, it does not auto save. Um, and so once you've pressed save, this is what it's going to look like there at the bottom. Uh, it's now a part of your budget. Once you have a bunch of line items, this is what it's going to look like. And you see that there's still a green edit button. You could still go back in and change any of those if you realize like, oh, actually, I need 40 posts or whatever. Um, you could change that. And it keeps a running total for you so you can see how you're doing. Okay, last couple details here. When you get to the livestock care plan, if your answer is no, I don't have any livestock involved in this project, you just press save and it doesn't make you fill out any more of the questions. Um, and if you say yes, then there are like 16 more questions, but they're, they're relatively painless. Um, so walk through those. I'll point out that you can view a draft of your proposal at any time, including if you want to just like not fill out hardly anything and just press view a draft because then you could see the whole thing. It might be kind of a good tool. Um, but if you've got a draft um, that's pretty well done, download it and then get it to somebody else with a fresh set of eyes. Um, let them take a look at it or even just step away from it for a day or two and then go back and read it. That's really helpful. When you're totally happy with everything, and when all sections are complete, there's a magic button that appears called Submit Proposal. It's green. You're going to click it. And in fact, then it's going to have a box that pops up, and you're going to press Submit Proposal again. you got to press it twice. Um, after you do that, you're going to get an automated email from us saying, congrats. Um, you're going to get a, a survey that you can fill out if you want about how your experience was um, so that we can learn from, you know, what worked well for you and what didn't. Um, and um, you also are going to have um, the option at any time before the deadline to log back in and unsubmit and change things. If you, you know, let's say you fill it out now and in the mo next month you think of something really smart that you wish you would have included, that's okay. Unsubmit, fix it, and press submit twice again. Okay, so let's say you, you, you understand how this works. You think your project might be a good idea. What should you do next? Uh, this is my suggestion. And what's not, oops, sorry, what's not listed on there is um, come to our office hours. Um, so we're going to try this this year and see if anybody takes me up on it. We're going to have an hour each week where you can just drop in, ask a question. Probably if you're wondering it, someone else is too. Um, but here is my contact information if you just want to reach out to me directly. Um, or if you want a connection to your state SARE coordinator um, so that you can work with them in more detail. Um, and if you download the slides, uh, or rather, I will send out the slides uh, and this recording, and it'll have the notes on all these sections, um, including ways you can follow us on social media and all the rest. Um, for right now, I think I'm going to stop screen sharing. And let's see, are there any new questions in the Q&A? Oh, I cannot hear you, Marie. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. Questions. Excellent. Um, <laughs> the first question is, do you do speaking engagements at bee clubs? What's a bee club? Like, oh, like a bee <laughs> club. Oh, I don't know. Where's your bee club? Um, that would be so fun. I know 
very little about bees. I once took a beekeeping class. I was very young and realized I didn't have enough money to try or enough knowledge. And um, I would I would love to get to know your bee club, though. Um, adding to that, if um, it might make more sense to consider contacting the Sarah State Coordinator in your state, see if they're able to attend an event and speak mm -hmm. on behalf of the Sarah Grant programs. All of our SER state coordinators have access to all this information that Liz has shared today. And they are our boots on the ground in the states to do that kind of outreach and engagement. That's a great point. I actually had someone inquire for here in Indiana today, and I said, I need to connect you with Lace McCartney. She's our in-state person. And if she can't come, um, each in-state person actually has a, a committee of folks who help with getting the word out about SER and attending conferences and meetings and events to share our resources and, and opportunities. Are crustaceans, shellfish, worms, and black soldier flies considered livestock? No. <laughs> and let's see, um, how are homesteads considered in the Farmer Rancher Grant? Indoor and outdoor builds that addresses family scale. Hmm, great question. Um, it's complex because I think homesteads are an important piece of the puzzle of our agricultural cross-section, right? Um, I think that generally, if you were submitting a project that was focused on homesteads, you would want to make a really strong argument for how you were going to share with other homesteaders and why this was important for agriculture in the North Central region. Um, I think that overall, generally the goal is to be funding work on farms that are focused on production that production could be given away it doesn't have to be for profit um but it's usually meant to be um quote unquote commercial scale but everybody defines commercial scale differently um so i know there's a very that sounds like a politician's answer um but I think if you want to apply you absolutely should but know that i bet the review committee is going to look pretty carefully at an application that's focused on homesteading. Um, another question came in, which was regarding yesterday's Youth Educator Grant webinar. Mm -hmm. um, and so I put in the chat, the slides and the recording from yesterday's Youth Educator Grant webinar are online now. So there's a link in the chat. You can go and view those slides or the recorded webinar from yesterday. Super. Do we have any other questions? What uh, There is another question that just came in. What about building a homeschool curriculum demonstration area for families? Mm, that would be in the youth educator category, I think, more. Um, I think that would be a tighter fit there. Um, we do have education projects in the Farmer Rancher grant um, that get funded. But we specifically say in the Youth Educator Grant that um, you know we welcome homeschool families or homeschool groups or co-ops to apply um, for projects that are going to benefit um, homeschool families. So I think that would have better odds, if I'm guessing. I will say this is my first time running these two programs, and so I'll be going through the review process with the reviewers for the first time this year and I'll, I'll get to know those folks better and and that group rotates um, people can serve for up to three years um, I'll say that if you think like gosh I think I want to apply for a grant someday I'm not sure if I'm ready yet serving on the review committee can be a really neat way to be of service and to learn more about these programs from the sort of back end and Marie can you tell us how people would put their name in the hat um, to, to be considered as a reviewer yeah there is a place online to um, apply to become a grant reviewer for any of our grant programs. We'll also be sending out an email in like the next week or so um, announcing um, those openings and giving you a chance to apply. I will put a link in the chat as well. Nice, thank you. Once I'm done looking at questions. Okay. <laughs> um, a couple more questions have come in. Great. Um, the next question is, how should a project which has components of research and demonstration be categorized or submitted? Hmm. I think you just say that you're both. 
Um, and we, there is, I don't think that there's a single place on the application where you have to define which one you are. Um, it's just that generally the projects fall into one of those three categories. Um, a question came through regarding um, identifying their state's coordinator. Mm -hmm. And so again, I just put a link in the chat um, where you can um, see who is the state coordinator in your state. In many cases, there's more than one. Um, and so you can reach out to either or both um, about potential opportunities. Oh, let me fix that. Hmm. Looks like folks might be having some technical difficulties with that. So I'll include that in the follow-up email that I send. Um, Um, another question, let's see, oh, someone having interest in becoming a reviewer. I'm going to put that link in the chat now so that if you're interested in becoming a reviewer, you can consider applying for that. Okay. And I'll include that in the email also. So I'm going to email all of you, um, uh maybe tomorrow but it might be monday or so um once we've got the recording um up on our website that way you can um follow up it'll have the slides from today with all the notes and then some of these links that we're talking about Um, and we've got somebody who has their hand up. Um, Marie, you'll have to educate me here. How does this work in the webinar setting? Can Caroline Todd, who's raised her hand, can that person speak? Yeah. Go for it, Caroline. I'm sorry. I If I clicked that, it was by accident. Ah, so. No worries. No worries. <laughs> um much. It's been a great webinar. I oh, good. <laughs> I'm glad it's been useful for you. Mm -hmm. um, super. Did we answer all the questions? I think, I think maybe so. I'm not. I'm just checking the chat and the Q and A one more time. Make sure we didn't miss anything. I think we've got all the questions answered. Great. There's a bunch of links in the chat, so I'm going to leave it open for a minute. So if you want to click through those links and bookmark them and save them, you can do so. Super. But um, I will stop the recording unless you have anything else you wanted to add, Liz. No. Really appreciate everybody joining us today, and we can't wait to see your proposals.